Welcome back to another episode of the Lumix Creators Podcast, where we talk to Lumix creators about all things Lumix and other general filmmaking tips and tricks along the way. Today, we have none other than Josh Cameron. Now, if you don't know who Josh Cameron is, that is probably a big surprise because you most likely already do. Josh Cameron is a UK-based Lumix YouTuber who talks all things about Lumix. He originally got his popularity from the original S5 series, and then that transitioned on to making content about the S5 II and 2X, and then also other Lumix cameras and systems. He talks also a lot about L-mount lenses and different things like that. But besides all of that, what we're gonna be talking about in today's video is how to become an official Lumix creator and what that means and what does that involve. Now, a little bit of a preface before we get into today's episode and get to talk to Josh himself. I am actually kind of under the weather when we film this. I'm still under the weather as I'm doing this intro. And yeah, I don't sound the best right now. Um, I pushed through and I tried to make this episode happen for you guys. But yeah, just thank you so much for to Josh for hopping on my channel, talking about what it takes to become an official Lumix creator, what that looks like, a couple recommendations, and how Lumix has been changing their marketing strategy and what they've been doing in supporting creators. And it's honestly really, really cool. So without further ado, let's just hop right into that conversation. So today I am joined with none other than Josh Cameron. He is the UK, wow, my voice is just lost all today, but Josh Cameron is the UK British version of myself basically, but much cooler, uh, talks cooler, and he looks cooler. <laughs> um, he talks all about things Lumix on his channel. He's also, fun fact, a drummer as well, which is a cool little thing that we both do. But Josh, introduce yourself to my audience and just kind of give them two cents on who you are and what you do. Of course. So my name is Josh. Um, I make videos basically about Lumix cameras. Um, so that's everything from getting to know how to use a system, lenses, all that sort of stuff. Basically anything surrounding the full frame Lumix lineup. Um, as well as that, I have my own full time business that I do making video content for corporate brands and agencies and stuff. So when I'm not making YouTube videos, I'm actually using the gear giving it a broad run for its money as opposed to, you know, people that might just sit there, make a video in their bedroom and say that they know how to use a camera. I think the twist is with me is that, you know, very much like Matt or Matthew. Do you prefer Matt or Matthew, by the way? Both? Um, I, I do both. Yeah, okay, okay, I get this okay. question all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so basically it just gives a little bit more sort of emphasis or depth to what I'm saying, you know, like I actually do use this gear day in, day out. It's not like I'm just sort of sitting there filming a plant or something and going, oh yeah, this is how the camera is. Like we put these cameras to the test here. So yeah, that's what I do. Dude. Yeah. I'm stoked to have you on the podcast, get a chat today. Um, so kind of in this video to break it down today for you guys is we're going to be talking about what makes a Lumix creator. And it's not just filming YouTube videos about Lumix cameras, which it could be that as well, but there's a lot more that goes into being a Lumix creator itself. But before we get really into that, Josh, I want to ask you, and I know you answered this a couple times, but why do you make Lumix niche content on here on YouTube? Okay, so the, the story behind it is actually quite interesting. So when the S5 was originally announced, I was about to jump from APS-C to full frame, and I was looking for specific things, uh, specific features that a full frame body would have that would help my work. And those were 4K 10-bit 422 internally, a decent log profile, and IBIS. Those are my three big things when I was looking for a new camera. So lo and behold, the S5 was the one for me. Um, but when I went to learn about this new camera that I just got, there was no one making videos about it. Absolutely no one. There might have been a few sort of launch date videos or, you know, sort of one week later sort of reviews and stuff. But in terms of actually making in-depth content about the Lumix brand, there wasn't really anyone, at least in England, doing it. So I was like, well, if no one else is going to, I am. And then you know, fast forward a couple of years and here we are. So yeah, that's essentially why I started making content surrounding Lumix cameras. Um, and then, you know, in that time, I've been very fortunate to work with a brand quite a lot and yeah, go and do cool things using their stuff. So yeah. For sure, yeah. I mean, it's been really cool seeing how Lumix as a company has been working more and more with creators. Um, where do you kind of see this whole Lumix niche in the YouTube space going forward in the future? For yourself and then just kind of in general as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually a really interesting thing to talk about because, of course, it's not only talking about the brand itself, but it's also the advancements within what the brand is part of, which is the L mount, essentially. So with the L mount, when it first, you know, when companies started using the L mount, people were like, oh, there's not enough lenses, there's not this, there's not that. But now, of course, we have Panasonic, we have DJI, we have Leica, of course, and we have um, Sigma. Black Magic. And Black Magic. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they're not making lenses, but yeah. Yeah, so, so, so it means that now we've got so many different companies using the L mount, which essentially means that, in my opinion, the Lumix content is becoming more and more prevalent because there's a lot more brands using the same lenses and therefore, if you're in a certain lens system, you're gonna be buying cameras in that lens system because switching systems is a pain, it really is. Um, but yeah, and also like now that Lumix have got the Facetex autofocus system, I now feel like it's become a very viable option for a lot of people, whether it's someone that just wants to stick a camera down, let the autofocus do the job for them, or people that wanna be a more discerning filmmaker like myself and of course like you, Matt. Um, so it really caters to everyone and therefore, I I, I can only see it growing. I can only see more people coming on board. And that's really what makes it cool is the fact that me and you are here before that truly starts to take place, you know? Um, so yeah. It's really cool to see how Lumix themselves is paying a lot more attention to the creators and pouring a lot more energy, pouring a lot more resources and effort into creators. There was the first Japan trip, the Shutter Showdown, which I don't know if you've actually watched the Shutter Showdown, but um, that was something I got to be a part of. And then they had the Lumix collective trip with a bunch of people from the Lumix creators backstage. Or is it Lumix backstage? No, it's, yeah, it's Lumix creators, creators backstage. backstage. I get that yeah. so mixed up <laughs> all the time. Because um, I want to say Lumix backstage creators, because for some reason that flows better in my mind. But Lumix creators backstage. So they've been pouring a lot into the Lumix creators. Um, from your perspective, what has that been like? you know, getting to do these cool trips, getting to have, you know, obviously some resources and camera gear sent to you. Um, what has that been like from your perspective and like kind of, what do you think about that? Give yeah, me yeah, I mean, it's 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 so cool because um, I don't know if I've spoken to you, Matt, about this too much, but essentially my comeuppance with Lumix, uh, Lumix was actually very, very sudden in a way, in the sense that I was making maybe two or three months went by of making videos. And then lo and behold, I had someone from Lumix in my inbox. So it was a very, very quick sort of thing to happen. Um, of course, at that time, they were still in the contrast system. And I do think that the new face tech system has essentially made them push this whole creative thing a bit harder because of course they want to see it they want to see their stuff being used more by more people. And naturally they would sort of get in touch with people like me and you to make that happen. And of course it's going really well for them. Um, but yeah, no, I think the support's been fantastic. I think something for me, as someone that makes pretty much only Lumix based content on YouTube, to have like a connect with a brand and to be able to get all of, you know, the sort of new lenses, new releases and stuff. And also like for me, the most important thing I think has been being able to talk to the engineers as well. Talk to the guys that are actually on the ground designing conceptualizing and making this stuff because of course it means that you know you, you get to understand their mindset behind why they're releasing these things not so much oh does it fit my use case is it not but it's like we made it for this use case for these people so this is this is why we have this product and I feel like a lot of brands sort of just release something into the world and will be like this is it people that get it will get it but people that don't won't but it's like I, I like the fact that Lumix are actually more so like well okay this is this is what we've made this is why we've made it and this is how how it can be used in you know situation X, Y, and Z. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's 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 awesome. I mean, you know me, man. I'm I'm a Lumix dieharder. So yeah, I know. I, I think that was like so fun at like the Ojai, California, getting to meet you, getting to meet all these Lumix creators. But it's also kind of cool, like getting to share a meal with like the Lumix teams, like getting to see that they like actually truly care for companies and they're not like a giant corporate company, you know, similar to Sony that just, you know, releases cameras and says, here you go. But it's like actually like getting to talk to Sean, getting to talk to these engineers and being able to like say like, this is what we want. Like I know there's obviously some limits, some software, the engineer complexities, like that's a whole nother thing in itself, but it is cool being able to like share that part of it and like being able to have all these moments. I know, uh, I don't know if you have like a a funny moment with one of the Lumix teams during the Ojai trip or one of your other trips, but I remember like with some of the marketing people, um, 
uh, the Japan team, I was teaching them what tacos in a bag was at the Linux Collective trip. Oh, and right. that was like <laughs> a fun experience, like in have with like with technically Lumix themselves. And I think that's like super special. Mm. Um, if you have a story, I'd love to hear a story. I mean, I've got a few, but I don't know if I can tell them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be off the mic later then. That's awesome. I um, love that. I mean, of course, like, there was one story from Ohio, which is essentially um, Lumix basically put loads of creators in Johnny Cash's ranch house, right, in this part of California that was really lovely. And the entire time we were there, there was a pool outside. But no one in the pool because we just were too busy doing other things, you know, doing, they had so many activities for us to do. It was just hard to find time to just sit down and, or, you know, just chill out in the pool. And then on the last day, um, Sean uh, from Lumix and I, Matt, of course you remember, because I think it was you that let me- I gave me you off. my shorts. Exactly. You, yeah. lent me, you lent me the shorts. And I was like, you know what? If no one else is going to do this, then I am. And I, I, I didn't have swimming stuff with me. And uh, luckily you had some like gym shorts or something that shorts, I could use. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, me and Sean from Lumix jumped into a pool that was actually, well, I was expecting it to be freezing, but it turns out it was like a bathtub. It was so warm. Um, oh, so, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, so that was yeah. a really cool memory, you know, like stuff like that, because ultimately as well, I think something that's really important is community and actually feeling like you're a part of something and that it's not just, you know, one person on this side of the world doing this thing and then that person doing that thing. I feel like it's really sort of showed that it's more so about building these connections and sort of growing with each other. And that's that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, I feel like that's so cool to see how Lumix is not just like this company, but it's more... Of a, they've humanized their brand in such a way with like even doing the Lumix Live that Sean does and all of these other different like moments and trips that they're doing with creators. So I guess kind of transitioning this conversation a little bit, um, how do you become, I, I know the term isn't technically this, but how do you become an official Lumix creator or Lumix ambassador or, you know, part of the Lumix creators backstage as we're both part of? Let's, let's, let's break that down. How do you actually become an official Lumix creator? Um, I mean, speaking from experience, the, the thing that I did was be passionate about the brand, post stuff about the brand and be consistent. Those were the three sort of things that I was doing. It was basically just showing love for it, using it, making videos about it, and then ultimately just spreading the message. Um, and I think that ultimately, you know, with, with any social media platform you're trying to conquer, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, whatever one you want to try and focus your energy on, the key is consistency. It's just making videos and being there week in, week out so that people start to see your videos, they start to recognize you as someone that uses this brand. And then from that point onwards, it starts to become more attractive for a brand like Lumix to work with you because of course, they've already won you over. They don't need to sell you on anything. You're already doing, you know, almost their work for them, you know, you're sort of educating. Um, and I feel like if you can sort of, you know, devote maybe a, a day a week to just, you know, making some Lumix content, then, you know, slowly but surely, you know, you'll start to build up an audience and then people will start to recognize it. You'll get in touch with, you know, maybe someone like myself or someone like Matt. And then that's that's sort of when the magic starts to happen. So yeah, I think that's all I can really, and and again, it'll be different. It, it'll be different for everyone, you know, because people, you know, it's not like everyone's gonna be making tutorials about Lumix cameras online. If they were, that'd be a very boring YouTube platform. Just generally, if everyone was just doing the same thing. But even if you're making short films, if you're making, you know, any creative content that you're making, either for your business or for yourself or for your por portfolio, just tag Lumix. You know, just send send the message to them and then they will they will see it they they see this stuff so yeah um yeah i yeah. feel i feel like it is really like you have to be kind of brand friendly for the company itself you have to be a good representation of the company but it's like josh was saying it's like you don't have to actually make content just about lumix cameras like how josh and i do now we're both just stupidly passionate about lumix cameras where it's like we just want to tell people everything about them and it's like I know my own communities uh, where I live and with my fellow filmmakers in San Diego, everyone's just like knows me as the Lumix guy. However, though, I'm also trying to convince basically everyone I know that I'm like, dude, you guys should shoot on Lumix cameras and all your issues that you have with these other cameras will just go away with these cameras because they're just so good. And it's like being someone that reps the brand himself. Now, did you reach out to Lumix? But you said they reached out to you, correct? You didn't actually reach out or do anything like that? 
Yeah, so I got a message, and I'm not going to say who it was in particular, but but I got a message from someone that worked uh, in the UK team, um, and it sat in my message request folder on Facebook for maybe a week. Facebook. I, yeah, yeah, and I had no idea that it was there, and it was only when I was actually out shooting with another Lumix creator that he told me about you know specific people I could get in touch with, and then lo and behold, when I went on Facebook that night, I saw I had a message from someone, and then from there it was it it, it was very um, you know not not slow as such, but it was very sort of conversational to start off with. It was never you know sort of okay, great, you're doing this stuff. This is now like you're now you know we now have a relationship. Like there took a little bit of building to it, and I think the first thing that I did was a GH6 launch event uh, here in London. Um, and that was, I mean, when was that camera announced? I don't know, 2019? Two years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, 2022. Oh, 20, no, 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 21, it must have been. <clears throat> February 2022. I just did a two year video on the GH6. Oh, 22. Okay, cool. So, they, so yeah, then it was 20, uh, 2022. But the launch event could have been earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that, that was the first time I actually got to meet people from Lumix. Um, but yeah. It was, yeah, it, it's, it's always just been um, very, very easy. Like, they're very easy to get along with. And it always has been quite an easy process for me. So, yeah. yeah. And I that's, like, something that I get a lot of questions about. Like, specific, specifically because I was part of the Shutter Showdown and different things like that. They are like, should I reach out to Lumix? And, like, honestly, could you? Yeah. But, like, I didn't. I just made content about the brand. I just showed off their cameras and, like... I just honestly and earnestly recommended the cameras because, again, I use them day in and day out. I use them professionally. I use them um, for any projects. I use them for travel. I use them just in general. And Lumix ended up reaching out to me to be part of the Lumix Creators Backstage system and like be part of that. And then that transitioned on to being part of the Shutter Showdown competition and begin to collaborate with people like Armando, Dylan, and Fritz. And like, it just continued on and on and on. But I don't know, I, I personally wouldn't recommend reaching out to the brand unless you feel like you're extremely established and that you would be a great fit for the brand. But I don't know, what, what would your take be on that? It's difficult because without sound, you know, like, you don't want to sound like you're selling too hard, and 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 the issue is, I mean, like doing YouTube, I get you know many sort of emails each day about um, you know people wanting to potentially start editing for me or start doing this for me or start they have this fantastic thing that they can do for me that's going to make my life so much easier. And when you get all of that, and as you can imagine, a corporation, a brand like Lumix, they're going to get a lot of that. So what I'd actually say is, yeah, basically what you're saying is just just, just do it. Like, basically just do it. And then see see where it uh, goes. If, you know, sort of six, seven months down the line, you find that the content's picking up, it's getting good traction, then trust me, they're going to notice you. Like, that's, that's the way it will happen. I feel like it's just been, like, such a cool honor just to see that. And it's also, like, a... A completely life-changing thing that happens once a company like this reaches out to you because like you said it's the resources like yes or if you're making content like Josh and I about Lumix cameras it does cost a lot of money to consistently buy the, all the brand new gear that they release so it is super helpful to like get gear to actually earnestly review it because otherwise we both would probably just buy the lenses buy the cameras just get everything ourselves and we both of us would still buy those gears either way if we were a part of it or if we weren't a part of it but it's just cool seeing how they've been like super supportive and also helps our both our channels grow in these aspects because we're just basically little marketing representers and ambassadors for this company so what's your perspective being part of the lumix creators backstage and what has that been like for you because i know you went to japan you did a bunch of launch events for the g9 mark ii the gh6 so what's that been like yeah, it's 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 really cool. Um, of course, like Lumix, um, the the Japan event was a global event, so of course that was a much bigger release. That was the S five two and the S five two X. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 just good fun. I mean, who doesn't want to you know who doesn't want to just talk about cameras with, with people that love cameras all day long? You know, it's great. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not really much else that I can really say about it apart from the fact that I've had a really, really good time doing it and that I hope it continues, you know? Um, yeah, it's just been, um, 
It's just been a very, actually, if I could say something, it has been very, very humbling in a way. Like you sort of really get to understand how the business works and really what what the purpose of, you know, sort of creating content for a brand is. You get to understand how that plugs into their marketing efforts. And of course, now with YouTube being such a big platform, ultimately, I mean, if you look at most camera tubers now, Three three out of five videos are trying to sell you a new product. Let's be honest. It's all very much about oh this this new lens has come out, buy it, or this new new, new camera's come out and it's going to change your life, or get this new filter, it's going to change your life. So this industry has really started to adopt YouTube as its place to market. So it's really interesting being on the you know the inner fold of that to really understand how it actually works and i think ultimately it's helped me understand more about influencer marketing generally for my business too so how i can help to sell influencer marketing to some of my clients so if you are someone that is a full-time filmmaker or creative you can actually understand a lot more about business by doing this too do you see what i mean yeah, no, that makes total sense. Uh, what would your perspective be on how Lumix has been doing um, in terms of their marketing in the last couple of years? I feel like the they had some really good launches like the S5 II, the S5 IIx, but they also had some not so great launches, except at least with the G9 Mark II in the States. I know they did a launch event there, but what is your perspective, how they've been doing in terms of marketing? I mean, I feel like their marketing is, I think it's great. But then again, I feel like I'm a little bit biased to that in the sense that because I've technically been a part of it, of course I'm gonna think it's great. I don't really know what else to sort of say about that one, to be honest. It's, um, it's it, I think that the team that, so, so basically Lumix have a global office, they have global marketing, but of course it breaks into regions. So what they do in the US, what they do in the UK, what they do in the rest of Europe, etc., it varies. So, so, so to say, you know, like one side of marketing is great for this, it, it's, it's different teams. So understanding how they're, I mean, of course they all communicate and they all ultimately have the same things to market and to get out to, you know, to consumers. But um, I feel like just collectively, they all seem to have their own things going on. I mean, for example, I've been seeing loads on Instagram recently that Sean's been posting about like Lumix were at a pickleball event. I know that you do a lot of pickleball oh, yeah. stuff. So like, of course, I've that's done, really cool. I've done pickleball with Lumix. Yeah. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. So again, there's that sort of sports element being captured to show how they're good with that. And then, of course, you have people, you know, like um, there's a guy called Tommy Rowe here in uh, the UK, and he does fantastic short f uh, films with the Micro Four Thirds system. So he uses the GH6, the G9 Mark II. He gets some fantastic anamorphic lenses from companies like Blazer and stuff like that. And he just shoots really, really amazing videos. And then, you know, sort of pushed out as well. I just think that the, there's so many facets that, you know, sort of encompass this whole sort of topic of marketing. And especially when you're marketing something that is essentially a marketing tool, it becomes really fun. Right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like, like you said, there's just so many different regions and parts of the world that Lumix is doing their own whole marketing thing, like the UK versus the US versus probably even Japan has their whole other thing too that like, we don't even really know about. Like there's a ton of different areas. So I guess I kind of landing the plane here is what do you think is the biggest way that they've been kind of supporting creators? Obviously gear is the biggest part, but like what do you think as kind of a last ending question? And then I got some actually fun questions at the end um, as well, but kind of finishing this topic, what's the biggest way that they've been supporting creators? By listening. I think that's a big one in in the sense that I feel like, you know, if so many communities online, whether it's Sony, Canon, Fuji, you know, Nikon, Red, now Nikon. Um, but yeah, so there's so many communities out there and a lot of them like there's the, there's a differentiating amount of input that the brand has with those communities. And Lumix on all the Facebook forums, they're active, they're listening, they're looking at what's uh, being said, they're looking at how they can improve. And you genuinely do feel like that with every single new iteration of camera, something about that new camera has been adopted because of their end user, because of what the end users are saying about the product. And I really struggle to see that with other brands. So honestly, I'd say that the biggest support of them is 
by actually listening, just by being a brand that wants to hear about how people want to use these cameras, as opposed to just being this sort of big entity in Japan going, we know better than you, this is what we're doing, buy it or don't. Because I feel like that's got a very sort of um, cold and almost unrealistic sort of expectation of how people will receive that product. Whereas Lumix know if we give the people what they want, they're gonna love it. And yeah, I think that for me is ultimately what Lumix does best, yeah. That was kind of the whole topic of this entire episode. So that is the premise of, you know, what makes a Lumix creator, how to sort of become one. Um, but I do wanna just ask some more fun questions to you as of well course, since man. I have you here. And we'll just, you know, just chat, say some random stuff and maybe maybe I cut this out, but maybe we leave it for, for the listeners. Um, What's something that you're looking forward to in terms of listening to the next camera? I know, I think this is a hot take opinion, but like, even though I love the blackout design on the S52X, I kind of like that like strawberry red like ring that goes around the S52. That's just something so weird that like, I love having that like sort of berry red on top or mm. apple red that was on top of it. Um, but what's, what's things that you're hoping and want Lumix to listen to to fit in to the next full frame camera, or next Micro Four Third camera? So I feel like companies are sort of taking the resolution train and just riding it. And I'm, I'm not part of that train, believe it or not. I don't think that resolution is everything. So one thing I don't- We don't need AK. We just don't. Like if I'm being honest, like, I don't think I've done many projects where they've required any output more than 4K. And normally they downsample it to 1080 anyway because of the screens they're using, social media, all that sort of stuff. So I think that I'm hoping they don't take this resolution thing and just run with it like most of the brands have done. Um, and honestly, my biggest thing is rolling shutter performance. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm someone that notices rolling shutter quite a lot in footage and if I see it, it bugs me. Um, I've actually seen it in a few, actually not, not high end films because of course they're using Aries and all that sort of stuff, but a few sort of lower end productions that I've seen and stuff. When you see rolling shutter, for me, the illusion's gone. That's it, done end of, like it, it no longer looks good to me. It just looks horrible. So one thing that I will say is that Lumix do a fantastic job of um, implementing a system that supports anamorphic shooting. But the thing is, is when you shoot anamorphic, because of the squeeze ratio, if you pan or do any quick movements, because you're squeezing it, that rolling shutter performance becomes exaggerated to the nth degree, which means that if you have bad rolling shutter in anamorphic shooting, it's gonna be horrendous rolling shutter. So for me, with their flagship um, cinema, oh, I say flagship sort of cinema camera, but it basically will be the next S1H, whatever that's gonna be and whenever that will come, all I'm hoping is that it has better rolling shutter performance. Yeah. Something Would around- Would you want a global shutter? I mean, that'd be lovely, of course, but then I'm also very realistic that Lumix is trying to hit a price point that's more competitive. So, you know, where they could go and make a camera that costs six and a half, seven thousand pounds or dollars, it's like, that's fantastic for people like me and you that could use it in that, you know, use case. But I feel like, Lumix does very well in the in in delivering products that are affordable and that have fantastic features packed inside. So I feel like Global Shutter would be fantastic, but I feel like it would almost be losing the point of Lumix in a bit. Uh, in a way, if you can get what I mean. Um how about you? Like what do you what do you want to see? Um I think I have like two things. One is like a must and one is like a want. The, the must, I think, is, again, kind of funny because it is resolution, but it's not because it's 6K, but it's just open gate 48 or 60 frames a second for social media. I think that's, like, the biggest thing just because, like, everything I shoot needs a vertical crop for all my commercial work. It's, like, I don't really care if it's a 420 10-bit. Like, well, I would, I would be kind of upset if it's 8-bit, but I would want 10-bit. Um, but so I think that's like a must in my books and then internal NDs would be great But like if we're losing IBIS, whatever get rid of it. Like I, I would rather keep IBIS in instead of having uh, internal ND so that's more of a want But besides after that there's not like many other things that I'm like I really want it's more like nitpicking um, mm. I know I think you weren't on the call, but we did have I think a call and the not too much it was just kind of our thoughts and some other thought that i think would be nice is like 
an intensity bar for real time LUT. I think that would be really nice. But it's all small things at this point. Like, I don't want to play the spec game. I don't want to like go resolution crazy. Like, mm. I know someone from Panasonic a couple years back said like they're not planning to like go 8K like how Canon and Sony are like we got 8K in our camera and it's like no one needs 8K. No one really needs 6K. 4K is already more than enough like is it future proofing maybe like but like phones aren't going to get bigger to like allow more resolution anyway so it doesn't really matter but there's not a lot of things. It's all small little ones and then just overall improvements because like if they can get internal nd into a mirrorless camera system and have the best image stabilization that is probably would be the biggest game changer with face detect autofocus on top of that and 6k open gate up to 60 frames a second that would literally be the perfect social media camera for youtubers for filmmakers for like every single category so I don't know. I feel like there's not really much else. Like it's it's almost like all there besides like maybe raw. Yeah, yeah. But. I mean, the whole raw topic is a is an interesting one because of course with the acquisition of like now it's becomes quite relevant. Um, you know, Red technically had the internal patent for that, but now Nikon owns Red. So to know whether they're gonna, I don't know how the the legality of that changes. Um, that. That being said though, I feel like raw video now has become such an easy thing to have via HDMI. So it's one of those things where I don't, I personally don't shoot raw. I mean, I think maybe I've, this year I've shot raw maybe once and that was just for a comparison. That wasn't really for client work because realistically the file sizes are a huge. Um, and one thing that I must say about Lumix cameras is that the long got uh, compression codecs, so the ones that are, right. I mean, you know, what is it, 150 megabits a second or whatever it is. Yeah, and, and, 100, 200. Yeah, and you know, like that, it plays nicely with my Max, it plays nicely with the file sizes at the end of it, it plays nicely with all my storage, so really, unless you're shooting, and this is again something else that I, think is important uh, to remember is a lot of people go for the best of the best quality because they feel like it's it's you know it's exactly what they need when in reality we're not all shooting blockbuster movies like a lot of what we're shooting is 30 second ads for I don't know a skincare brand or for a corporate company who you know just wants to show it at their next board meeting or something so people that sort of get too caught up on that like you, you start to realize when you do have cameras that are capable of all this stuff what you actually need and what you don't need and and that's why I think the S5 II and the S5 IIX was such a good split to do because a lot of people don't need ProRes, a lot of people don't need RAW via HDMI, so therefore give them a camera without that for slightly less money, you got yourself a perfect camera, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah. No, I feel that. I feel like it's like, I, I mean, I think we're both shooting in long gop and it's like, this is plenty good enough. Like the quality difference isn't like, a massive huge difference to see maybe it's a the pro reds offers a little bit more of a better editing workflow but it's going to cost you 500 gigabytes more mm. just for a project and it's like gets really really crazy is it nice to have yes is it great to have if a client wants it also yes but it's like again it's not super necessary and it's not super needed but it would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice. I think uh, some type of raw would be nice, but it would be more or less like a compressed raw that like is easy in small file sizes. And hopefully in the future, they figure out how to give us those specs and give us the resolution without having to give us massive amount of storage to require that resolutions. So, um, and la uh, landing the plane here, last question I have for you, cause you said it, um, what's the best diet for cats? The best diet for cats. You said it in our text. What is the what is the best diet for cats? Oh damn! Don't don't! I did say something about this. What is the best <laughs> you did say it. <laughs> I know. I can't remember what I said now. You did. Uh, that's literally all you said in our text was. We could talk about whatever. You know, best diet diets for cats. Oh so, right, yeah. Well, okay, so, I mean, it depends on what you have. I mean, if you've got an outdoor cat or an indoor cat, you know, the sort of rules change a little bit. I must say that wet food with my two cats when they were still alive, bless them, um, they loved wet food. They absolutely loved that stuff. But the thing is, is they gained weight very quickly. But the thing mm. is, is as a human being, 
I can't comprehend how an animal can look down at a bowl of, a bowl of just plain horrid biscuits and be excited by that. So I, I've never understood dry food as a as as an animal owner because for me, I like a little bit of moisture in what I eat. You know, I don't want to eat just rocks the entire time. Yeah, right. So I'd say the best diet for cats. I mean, we have um, a brand here called Sheba. Do you have Sheba in in? I in I the don't US? know. I have a dog. My dog right now is trying to enter the frame from our dog door. <laughs> oh, so but no. Wait, so, so is there a dog door that goes straight into the like sort of office area for you? Yeah, it's right here. Brilliant, love that. <laughs> love that, man. Come on, Mila. Let's go. See, she just wants to come. Come on, Mila. But yeah, cool. Well, that's all I had for you today. But so, thank you so much for joining. Where can uh, people find you? They can find me on YouTube. Just type in my name, Josh Cameron, and I should be the first Josh Cameron to come up. I hope. Uh, if, if, if SEO has done me any favors, I'm hoping it'll be that one. Um, so yeah, just type in Josh Cameron on YouTube or even on Google. Hopefully again, Google and YouTube are the same thing. So I should come up hopefully. And yeah, that's that's that. You can find me there. And uh, Instagram is at josh.fmc. Um, there I post a little bit of behind the scenes of me filming the videos, stuff that I'm you know sort of doing. So for example, I've currently got a Leica in at the moment, which oh. I'm testing. So testing this against the Lumix cameras to see whether the whole Leica thing is a myth or not. And I've got a video coming out about that hopefully this week or next week. So that, that'll be a good one. That'll be a good one. So yeah. that's It's definitely probably out based on how long it'll take me to edit this. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, see, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I love that. Also, I just, I love the, the banana color paper roll that you have in the background, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. You know what? I only used it once in one video and I just felt like it just, the issue is, is with my skin tone, it just, it was so hard to get much separation from that. So when I was trying to edit the skin by itself, I was like, at the background, there's some weird things going on sort of thing. Um, but it does look great for product B-roll because of course, black and yellow is just a gangster combo. So black cameras, yellow it background. Is. Yeah, it looks good. But this gray yeah. one, gets used most more often than not now because it just is a, a clean and simple sort of, yeah. It's super, super mm. clean. Awesome, well sweet, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on, cheers. Sweet, sweet. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this episode with Josh Cameron. And Josh is such a fun guy. He is a lot like himself on camera and off camera. So the way you hear him on his YouTube videos, he's exactly the same. He's such a fun little Brit um, and he's such a genuinely cool guy. So to wrap and conclude everything that Josh and I talked about, if you wanna become an official Lumix creator, what should you do? Well, the reality is just make content with Lumix cameras, be ecstatic and actually stoked to use them and represent the brand in such a way that is authentic and true to yourself. You don't need to make YouTube videos like we do about Lumix cameras. There's already a ton of us that do that. If you want to, go for it. But just make content about cool stuff. It doesn't have to be about the cameras, but just tag Lumix. Show them that you love their cameras, that you recommend their cameras, and be a true fan to Lumix. I wouldn't suggest reaching out, which you can if you want, but they're got tons of stuff happening. Lumix reached out to me to be part of the system and be part of the crew. And it's been honestly such a huge blessing to not only myself, but to other creators like Josh and people like that. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this podcast episode with Josh. If you want to see me talk to another British Lumix creator, check out this podcast episode right here. And then YouTube recommends you might like this right here. Until the next one, peace.